like this walking thing you know and I'm kind of been upset I'm always like to walk but I'm really obsessed with walking now as like like this uh, you know walking and just thinking while you're walking and and um, because it does sort of like change the way you think as opposed to sitting down you know and I always have to move around a lot and I like to go out I like to go out in the woods and walk, and I can walk all day, you know. And I think this sort of this heightened, the way this thing is is up so high. I mean, I bet if I saw it in 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 you know its full size, it would be I would be, you know, it'd be impressive because it's just like that, you know, semi ponderous but also thoughtful stride, you know, like you can just walk over everything, you know, and eventually get by it or something. Cause I, I don't know, I think I think unless you can somehow um you just have, somehow have to be able to to divorce yourself from all the the you know the the signals that are coming in all the time, you know. There's too many of them, so. That's what, that's what I like to walk. I used to walk to immerse myself in the world, but now I feel like I walk to get away from it, you know. Unfortunately, I'm getting older and I've got arthritis in my knees and my legs. And <laughs> I can't walk as much as I used to. I think th these are all human beings, modern human beings in states of alienation um, that they're all isolated. They're all unable to touch the environment, the real environment. The clam guy, he's, he's, inevitably he's gonna get shut in that clam. He's not coming out. It looks like this guy either spun his own web or he's, tr he's trapped. In, like, a, like a, almost like he's trapped in a, in a religion. Like he's in some kind of religious dome. This guy can't see the ground and touch it. The guy in the bowl. And this guy is, is, he's either so successful or he's so um, egotistical that he can't come down from his, you know, his, his mountain. And this guy looks like he wants to come down and he wants to, or he wants to, he wants to come close to the ground somehow or he's trying to examine it, but he can't. These, 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 these brass poles are preventing him. The guy who's spinning out of control, I mean, he's obviously trapped in some kind of, you know, multi-dimensional nightmare. The man has no arms. The figure has no arms. He has two legs and a head and oval, and, and I, there's a certain mystery to that. No, we don't use our hands anymore. They're modern beings. It doesn't really have to be a man. It could be kind of, um, it looks like a man. It doesn't look like a woman, but it's sexless. Is it another being, or is it another human force? We'll just have input sockets in our brain and instead of typing we'll just sort of feed information out and speak it. And the fact that these, cre these figures don't have any arms, that's also intriguing to me. Because it's like kind of a limit, I don't know what it is about that, but... I mean I like the fact that they don't have any arms. It makes them kind of like animals, you know, because animals are all head, you know, legs and heads. But, uh, 
your hands are a way of distracting you too, so if you didn't have any. We make noise, 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 it's just noise, 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 noise. My thought process of the processes have been so changed by you know, just the constant, you know, overkill of, of everything around you, you know, and you're like, your brain's directly wired into it, you know. It's like as, if you had the surface of the, you know, the surface of the city, you know, up to like whatever, you know, 20 stories, and it's just like, it's nothing but electricity, but if you were above that, you know, maybe you could think a little clearer, you know, it's like going into the mountains or something, you know. You get, there's less and less, you know, um, stimulus until you, if you get high enough, all you really hear is the blood in your head, you know. And maybe, maybe if there's like a bird comes around or something, but you don't really hear anything, the wind. It's very quiet, you know. And if it's so quiet, you know, you're, it's going to change the way you think. And a lot of things that seem important are going to, are going to fade away because you know, the context that makes them important will be gone. The first thing that comes to my head to describe it is a man on the plate of life. And he is balanced perfectly in his life, in his own reflection. He's balanced on his head in his own reflection and he'll never get a chance to see himself. Because if he looks down, he'll fall through. And everything that he's been working for has been ruined. So he's comfortable, balanced in his own reflection, spinning through life as this world goes around and around and around. He can survive so long as he does not try to see himself. Vini. Oh, I just see now that it's reflecting too. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Oh. <laughs> What's on the other side? I, I wonder. <laughs> it's a good optimistic uh, piece. <laughs> you know, it's hard work. Person, oh, no. Oh, oh, cool. Now that person's just like floating. <laughs> the other side is just like floating in outer space without, thank God, his feet on the ground. <laughs> They're just floating there. <laughs> Maybe it's like the American dream guy. chose one because I had to choose one. You know, I might have chosen all six because uh, I also like the way that they work together. But I was drawn to this one um, mostly because the image first reminded me recently I was in Venice and I saw an exhibit of uh, medieval devices of torture and um, you know, they had all kinds of, you know, stretching racks and um, spikes that went into people's ears. And one 
piece was a very large piece of wood similar to this, but on about half the scale that this one will be. And uh, it was, uh, people were put on top of it and pulled down through their bowels. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was the image that it first struck in me. There's something about it that is really sexy. Um. I guess you could say I was, um, I was fired from a job. It was a long time ago. And I got really crazy when I walked out onto the street and I was hyperventilating. I was having like an anxiety attack, but it looked like I was having an epileptic seizure or something, which I, I don't have epilepsy. And I was standing there and my chest was heaving in and out and I was sort of frozen because I was in really bad straits, of course. And I uh, was fired really unreasonably from this job where I was barely making any money. And uh, I, walked, I, I walked out of the door and the guy fired me and there I was standing on the sidewalk public, you know, like having this very private anxiety attack. And um, somebody walked by, like a waiter from next door walked by and said, are you having an epileptic seizure? And I said, no, <laughs> like that. And uh, it was awful. I mean, it looked awful, I'm sure. And then, um, and then the irony was that they knocked on the door of the place where I worked and so to take me to the hospital. And they ended up, I ended up having to get into a cab and on either side of me were sort of <laughs> you know, the evil people that fired me. So I was sitting on either side of these people that I really disrespected and thought were evil, sort of. So there I was being ushered to the hospital and I was sandwiched in between these people who were pretending that they were my friend and that they were helping me, but I guess they were, but I, it was very oppressive. Plus I was very embarrassed to be having this kind of fit in front of them. I don't know why that, I mean, I guess because it's, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's what it reminds me of. characters and I'm not saying that I'm lost I just think that 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 times I feel lost fantasy for me is only the rearrangement of facts funny because I'm seeing an actual statue and I'm actually I'm, it feels like I'm seeing myself on top of these these extensions and uh, <laughs> it's I'm almost embarrassed because I feel open I feel like the world can see me whoever see this sees the statue can see me it's like my face on the statue and I don't like it <laughs> 
<laughs> but I do like the statue. Well, inside the house, outside of my room, but inside of our house, um, was very toxic, a very toxic, poisonous kind of atmosphere. So I definitely was much safer in this little cocoon of a bedroom than I was in the rest of the house. But even in my room, um, I was afraid. Even when I was little, I thought there were monsters in the room. I would play all kinds of games with my, you know, I would, I, mental games. Like, if my teddy bear is, I started off with, if my teddy bear is on my bed, no, I started with, if my teddy bear is in my room, then I'm safe from the monsters. But then that, then I realized, no, that's not good enough. And then I would go, okay, if my teddy bear is on my bed, then I'm safe from all the monsters. And then I would think about it for a while, or the next night it would be, no, that's not enough either. So then I would come up with something else, and it would be, if my teddy bear is on the bed, and the blanket is up to here, and the chair is placed just so, then the monsters can't get me. And it would like get, you know, and, until like after a year, I, I had like, you know, 15 or 20 different um, things that had to be, not physically, not like, arranged but just in my mind I had to say you know okay I've got my ten animals in the room I've got this I've got that I just had all these little you know the demons can't get me if and then I had this whole checklist that I had to sort of check off in my mind before I could go to sleep. Tagging along with my older brother with all his friends and they're all older and they're cool and I'm not I'm the little kid you know I'm kind of like literally following behind them they're trying to walk faster and lose me but my brother can't because he knows he has to watch out for me and so then they go into somebody's apartment and they start to play cards together and I kind of want to get in the game but they don't let me I'm sitting outside of it and I keep complaining and whining like come on Steve let me in the game and you know come on guys I want to be part of it and I just seem to keep moving further away sitting down like this like this character in the sculpture and like I am now and you know I don't know why the, the harder I sort of push force to get in the more I'm moving away and it finally like my brother looks over and his friend kind of signals him like, yeah, he's gone too far, yeah, he's annoyed us enough, he won't shut up. So they, they, they get this like robot or some kind of force, which is sort of like the, you know, um, the, the cone and, and um, it sort of like lifts me up and pulls me out of this thing and I'm saying, Steve, and I, I feel as though I'm flying and I'm above them and I could be dropped. So it, very exhilarating, this feeling of flying, being taken, but it's also scary because my brother doesn't care. I'm all alone, and they're like sort of giggling and saying, and they're going back to the card game, and I'm just being lifted up, lifted further away and above the ceiling and way out, I don't know, into the space or just, uh, so then I might get scared. When you're a kid and you go to a circus or a, f or a, um, um, or a fair, like a state fair, they sell these little things called Mexican jumping beans. And what they are, they're little beans, little beans that have worms inside them. And what they do is, they put the beans inside these, this very hard shell and then put food in there and a little air they can breathe. So they live about, they probably live about 20 days inside. They're just eating the, the seed material and living in this little box. And so you get them and they just, they're exactly this shape without the head and the arms. And um, you put them in your hand, they jump around, they, they're really weird and strange, and, and they're, you know, they're tragic, because in, in a few days they're going to be dead. So it's like modern man meets the Mexican jumping bean. on the beach and I was walking along in the sand and I was very hungry 
and I looked down, and there was a fish laying there. Now, normally, I wouldn't eat a raw fish, but in this case, I was uh, <laughs> I was extremely hungry. So I took the fish and I just grabbed it and took a big bite, I think, out of its stomach. And uh, ate, and chewed, and swallowed, put the fish back down on the sand, and all the, uh, the flesh of the fish, like, regenerated right in front of my eyes. And then the fish winked at me. <laughs> that was kind of strange. She um, um, had a radio show, radio talk show, and that I was her co-host, um, and I was very, very, very scared. And the show was for children. And slowly but surely, as we talked to the children, as we talked to them, they aged. They got older. Um, so we'd start off with a kid, and maybe he was 11. By the end of our conversation with him, he was in his 30s. And it, to Jane, it didn't affect her at all. She was not, it, it, it was another normal day on the radio. To me, it was very disturbing. And so, and because you're on radio, you're live, you can't, you're not able to talk about what you really, what you really want to talk about. You have to sort of, you have to keep fielding questions. You have to keep, um, the, you know, the repartee going with both your co-host and the kids, the people in the audience. So when we got to a commercial break after a few moments, I said to Jane, Jane, these people are all aging, you know, before our ears. We can hear them aging. And she said, I know, isn't that great? We're helping them to grow up. And I said, um, yeah, I, I understand that, but um, shouldn't we be helping them just to get through the day? You know, it's not our responsibility. What if, they're, what if they're 35 tonight and they really resent us for making them that old that quickly? And she said, don't worry, they really trust us. And then it got worse because through my perception of the, 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 the kids, they were getting more and more hostile because they realized that Jane was shaping them. She was changing them into adults, and I was helping her. And they were calling up, like saying, hey, you motherfucker, don't, you know, don't, don't change my friend into a 35-year-old. Into a What do you want? It's July 4th, all of my friends are away, and I decide I don't want to go, so I'm going to hang out on the pier. And, and I'm hanging out over there, and I'm drinking beer. And I meet this guy, and we're just hanging out and drinking beer. And, and um, immediately I can tell that this guy isn't my usual type and he's not somebody I would really go after. But I thought, um, you know, what the hell, I'm going to live on the edge, I'm going to take it out there, I'm going to have a good time with this guy. I saw the car from up ahead and it would round a bend and then again I would see that three times and uh, he finally gets to the top of the canyon where he can't, can't drive any further and uh, parks the car and starts walking up a trail. And I didn't realize at the time that that I was actually a person there watching him doing this. It was just something I was wa seeing. I mean, like, throughout the course of the day, we, d we decided, you know, I'd give him my number, we'll hook up later on, whatever. But at some point, I decided to take him home right in that moment, that day. So. Um, we get to my house and immediately, as I lock the door, I realize that I shouldn't have brought this guy home, that this is like total trouble and, and you know, and I'm already thinking, okay, how am I gonna get out of this, you know? He's, again, walking, I see him and I lose sight of him around a corner. 
then again I see him kind of coming around a corner. You could hear the crunch of his footsteps on the, the stones and the wind in the trees. And uh, uh, third time he passed, I lost sight of him. I couldn't see him. And so I, that's kind of when I realized I was there, I was chasing after him. And then, and then, you know, he was like re laying on top of me, like resting his forearm on, on my neck. And, and then at one point he looks me straight in the eyes and he says, you know I'm going to kill you, don't you? And as I round the corner, I see him uh, going like this from the back again. I couldn't see his face. And then he would go like this. And then like this, you know, just deciding which way to go. And, and sort of in those moments I see, uh, I flinch, but I, I swear to God I see sort of like my soul leaving my body. I see me looking down on this situation like the sculptor. I see the outside and I vaguely see that little man on the inside that's controlling all of this. I literally set down a camera and suddenly the vision of the camera went like a Hitchcock film or, or a, it was askew. I start to tell him all of my sort of intimate problems or things that are bugging me or like real sort of issues in life. I mean, I tell him that, um, that I've you know, that I lost my mother, that, you know, I didn't have a really strong relationship with my father. I was watching me approaching him, and uh, I sort of go around him, and I remember, that's, I could also see, it was strange, I could also see his, uh, my point of view walking up to him. So I tell him all of these stories, but as I'm conjuring up these stories, um, I get really emotional about him. So I'm like really crying and really we weeping and crying. And I can see that, that it's working with this guy and that he, on some level, has connected to the inside of me and, 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 my, and the real person, what makes me tick. And he started to back off a little bit. And as I approached him, he had this gun in his mouth and he looks up like this. I pulls the gun away and I take a gun out and kill him before he gets to kill himself. the sculptures that one scares me the most I don't know why but that piece has made me sad <laughs> um, I guess art has a way of doing that not realizing it the day was my mother's birthday and uh, we were having a party next door at my neighbor's house for my mother and uh, I remember running over and uh, after finding out somebody knocked on our door and uh, a neighbor and he had uh, so the police had told him that our father was found up in uh, a canyon and uh, and that he was dead and uh, I ran over to tell my sisters and my brother because so we were getting ready for a birthday party. <laughs> and uh, my sister started laughing. <laughs> it's that irony, that paradox of the more I go in, the more I search, the more I try to find myself. You're diving in and you just go closer, closer, closer to yourself and then you just, you're not even there anymore.
you just become a ghost, an empty shell. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you go so far that you pass. Uh, you, I don't know, I guess you go to a place that's beyond understanding. But on the other hand, if you stay in the, in the very conscious realm of, of trying to understand, you can never penetrate that uh, forever place. I understood the fragility or the, of life, and uh, it was the day that my father killed himself, and I felt alone. But that is so real, that's so true. And I, yeah, until you mentioned it, I didn't think of that, about the diver. It's like once you go in, and you can go in so far, and gets to touching the water, and then disappearing into another place that there's no there is no reflection after that. There's no... He never left a note. He left a... a uh, $20 bill on the television with a 44 Magnum bullet standing on Jackson's face. What happens in the state between sleep and uh, being awake? Uh, I often have this thing happening that where I'm climbing stairs and I'm climbing, I'm climbing, ah, and I miss a step, and I guess I wake up or I, uh, I don't know, yeah, wake up. Or I'll go back to reality. But I do have good sex dreams. I never remember who there I'm having sex with, whatever. I just like remember having great orgasms. And I hate to wake up. And I wish I could actually have sex like that in real life. You know? And I don't know what kind of sex it is because I never remember. I just remember waking up and like, God, is that powerful. I'm going to imagine that I'm a panther, a black panther, the animal, um, not the militant, you know, group. And um, because animals don't think. So when I go on my lunch hour, I'm going to imagine that I'm an, a panther and I'm going to walk to the, the drugstore or whatever and I'm going to see if I can turn off my brain like an, and just be like an animal and not have any brain. <laughs> I remember uh, when I was young, I was uh, sleeping and my sister was sleeping in the room too and she woke up one night <laughs> and said she, I, I guess she was talking in her sleep but uh, maybe she wasn't and she said where's my head where's my head oh there it is and she started to laugh <laughs> uh. and I went to the store and I got a sandwich or whatever it was and I just remembered, and then I, I walked back to work, and like nobody noticed, nobody on the street looked at me funny, like, you know, I was able to, I somehow thought in my mind that I was able to function as an animal with no brain, and still able to function, and nothing terrible happened. So maybe I should think of that, see, I'm in the, see, I'm in the two, but I'm in a different two from all of you. <laughs> That's the way it seems sometimes, not all the time.
I know there's got to be somebody out there like me. <laughs> uh, As I was on the calculator, you know, punching numbers, and I would, and I was so bored that I, my, I would sort of try to, I would think about other things. I would daydream or whatever as I was doing this. But then I started hearing these voices. And, um, and, I said thing, and I would say to myself, I would say to it in my mind, who are you? And, it, and it's, I don't remember what it said, but, but then I said, where are you from? And it was a bunch of them. And they said, and they gave some number, like EK234 or something like that. And so then I thought, oh my God, they must be aliens. And so then I, I listened and I asked them all these questions. And this went on, like, whenever I was at work, as I was doing the calculator, I would, like, listen and I would hear this stuff. And I would say, who are you? And they, you know, and they, I would ask them questions like, well, why are you here? And why is civilization the way it is? And, you know, all these questions that, I, that one would want to ask an alien. And, um, and I don't remember what their answers were. Sometimes life, for me these days, at moments, it's as if somebody is telling me, you're not here, you're in the other room. <laughs> and I say, what? And they say, you're not really here, you're in the other room over there. And I go, I don't think that's true. And then uh, I run into somebody else, and they say the same thing. Next thing I know, everybody's telling me I'm not here. I'm in, a, I'm, I'm over there. I'm in another room. I'm outside somewhere. Is he going to trip? Is he not? Is he going to go back to reality? Who can say? <laughs> Maybe next episode. I consider those labels and titles very important. So I don't flippantly just say, you know, man on top of it all, you know. That would then lead me to, it, you know, thing on top of it all, person on top of it all, me on top of it all, but not on top of it all at all. I would call it, we call it a piece of the sculpture, it's someone uh, who's sitting right on, on top of the world.
the kiss, give me.